I actually come from British Guyana. I came from Nevis, um, one of three islands founding the presidency. It sinks Nevis and Anguilla. I'm from Portland, Jamaica. I came to join my husband. I came to England for quite a few reasons. I was very adventurous. I worked on two ships, which I didn't need to, but I wanted to see what life is like, other to being stuck under my parents. I left Nevis, went to St. Kitts, and took the, the steamer from St. Kitts to Genoa. We were on this big Spanish boat for 21 days, so that was murder, to be honest. It was very hard. Good 400 of us came on the Empire Wind Rush. Well, I was, I was around this bottom here. The, I think the second or third, I was in, actually in the middle of the ship. And that was the year 1948. We arrived at Tilbury Dock on the 7th of June. Well, from New Haven, they, we were put on a train to London. And then from London, a train to Birmingham New Street. After we get off the boat, we have to take the ferry. And then you get a train. And when I was sitting on the train, and the train stopped in London for us to come off, I didn't want to come off. Because I, I hate you not to see, to be honest. So I sat there for a little while, and a lady came back and said to me, and you're coming off the train. All the men, your husband or whatever, how they're looking for you. I sat there. I don't know. I didn't want to get off. Then we were taken from Tilbury Dock to Clapham Common. Those who had friends and relatives living in England, they were issued with pass to travel to wherever they're going. Well, I had no one in England, so I went to Clapham Common. Well, the truth is, when I came here and I got down there, I didn't expect place to be like that here. Because it's tatty and shabby and so on, and we think it would be looking nice, you know what I mean? That's the truth. Well, we thought all the houses were factories. <laughs> That's one of the things that got us. We thought it was, they were all factories, the chimneys on top. We didn't know the use of the chimneys. And I was coming home the night and somebody said to me, outside the park, when I look out there, I couldn't see anybody. So I came out to walk up this street and I feel against the wall because I'm feeling to see where I was and I feel a man. And he said, oh, huh? and I keep quiet <laughs> because I was saying, if it was now and you're feeling him, you turn around and grab you, I don't know, I've never known, I, shut my I couldn't see. Then as the winter, came in, we, we started to find out that it's really cold. So Nothing we, like the Caribbean. I came to join my husband. He was here six months before me, and then he was a shoemaker at home, make shoes. But when he came here, the only place that he used to have a handmade shoe shop was in Manchester. And he was already in Birmingham. So he had to go to night school to learn engineer. So when he goes to work, I um, come home five o'clock. Then I used to go and do a few hours in the evening till nine. When I was in the Caribbean, I, the jobs that I used to do, I used to work for public works. So I came here, I made application to the prison service, which 
They said I was all right, but um, they weren't ready for black people doing that job yet. So I had to look elsewhere. Well, as I said, I wanted to get my family up rather urgently. So I took what I could have got. I remember the first money I got. Woolworth was nearby. And I went, I can't remember now, I can't remember how much it was, but I used to have Terry Lynn baby nappies, and I went in there and buy 12. And I think that was my whole week wages No, <laughs> I can't remember how much it is, but I remember I went in there and I bought 12. Most of my friends were coming down to Shropshire, so I went and re registered with this foundry. Arriving in Telford, uh, there was few coaches there, only 38 of us, and they took us and showed us the foundry where we were supposed to be start work. Well, I applied for um, bus conducting. I got the job when I came, after a month, but I couldn't tell the authorities that I had just come in the country because I knew nowhere. But going on the buses, especially on the number 11 around Birmingham, it helps. You just stay, you just live. You know you had to live there. And everything was depressing and, and really hard, depressing years. But I think I'm a survivor. You could get beef, stale, black beef. Well, I find it was black. And you take it on, you go with it, it black, and you put it to cook it like froth. That wasn't a very nice to us, yes. We could make a meal out of many things. If some people have rice, they could make porridge, they could make soft rice and peas because it's already soppy and things like that. You could get Quaker hoods and then we would make, you know, yes, I didn't find it too bad with the food. I met my wife, she's from Austria. She was very good, very good to me. England was a strange country to her and England was a strange country to me. So we got together, we got married and I have three lovely children. I'm very proud of them. Well, with the conducting, they, they, they put you to a test with like arithmetic, adding up um, pound, shilling and pence. That's what it was then. And then you had to write, I can't remember, I had to write an imaginary uh, accident report. Well, the three of us used to mostly move together to fight. One fellow named we called Ballerina, one fellow we called Bieber. Those are the other two boxers in the crowd and myself. We went to a dance and this lad, colored lad, was dancing with a white girl. And this white lad pulled the girl away and of course he defended this girl. And one fight broke out, the whole hall was smashed up. The fight ended up in the street. About six or seven England lad had him against the wall and beat him up. So I recognized David and I got him and I knocked two out. One they took to Shrewsbury Hospital. I think I'm a survivor, that's the truth, because it was very hard, you know, you, you didn't have time, I didn't have time to make friends really, and at that time, I find a few black people that was here were more loving to each other, you would find they would visit you on a Sunday, I don't think I did a lot of visiting, because I had the children to look after, so I didn't do that, but they used to come and visit us. And you cry a little. I mourn a little, quarrel a little, why did you send for me? But you know, as time goes by, um, 
you get accustomed to whatever it is. You know, there is one thing about human. We have to worship. And if we don't worship God, we worship the devil. And you could know the devil work is not love. It's fighting, swearing, cussing, drinking, and drunking. uplift me. I know God is always there for me. When I cry to him, he listen. He take me, he listen to me. And uh, I tell you something. I never ever pray for anything special for myself. Because I never ask anything. So, but yes, one thing. I, I ask that I might be um, can think for myself. No matter what happens, let me can think for myself. And God promised that, he says, let your desire be known to me. And my desire is to be with him after I die. So those are the things. Is that it? You can have, you can have a... It is wonderful, really, when all of us, in this, in this occasion, he worked very hard, and he never sick. He had a little pain at his back when he sick to that corner there too long. And uh, the Thursday, oh, a young lady took me shopping, and um, he said he was going to the doctor to pray them on for his back. And then he came upstairs and said, oh, I'm not feeling too good. I called the doctor. And while he just stand up, I hear boom, and he just fell. So I called the ambulance, and they came. I get strength anyhow. I pull him, pull his head over, and they call the ambulance, and um, they took him to the hospital. That was a Friday, midday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. He died early Tuesday morning. I don't think he would cope. As much as I cope, if it was me die, I don't think he could do it. The Bible says, when you die, your thought perish. Until when Christ come, every high should see him and he will give back everybody their breath. Some to life everlasting and some to hell destruction. So therefore, I don't believe he's looking down. I just believe he die and it's like a piece of meat, it rot. But the memory is always there. The best thing I have that my children grow up and they love me and I love them and grandchildren and that's the best thing I have. I have probably about 36 grandchildren, 9 great grand, 10 children so I think they are on a whole, I know they, I hear from everyone, almost everyone every week and every day so I think that is the, the blessed thing for me. You know. I lift up my eyes unto the hills, from when cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. All my bus career was at Perbar Garage. I've been there for 1958 until retired recently. It was different. Even learning to drive, you, you had been paid or you, you had to do it in your own time. And the buses had no power steering, no doors. Of course, it was more responsibility to be a driver. but you had the advantages as well. You did get respect, but if any unpleasantness went on, uh, like say somebody, if you are a conductor and you notice someone is overriding and you might pull them up, they ask them to pay some more money or something, they would use insulting remarks most times. 
some even would like to punch you or hit you, assault you or something, but it's a job and you just have to get on with it. When I started, there were no motorways. Perry Bar had no flyover, Hockley had no flyover, and these roundabouts and God knows what, they, they, they weren't many. And if you go into London, you had to go through Coventry. No M6, no, no nothing. I think driving on the whole in this country, especially if you like bus driving, I, I think it's, instead of saying a good bus driver, a bad bus driver, I think bus driving or driving is just sheer luck. Sometimes you could be as careful as ever and all in a sudden, out of the blue, something happened, which really make you look like you're a bad driver. One of the things I looked at was um, that the, when you work for the bus company and you're sick, you, you get your pay. You get a sick pay, which you could have managed then. By coming to England, um, most people felt that they would have come and spent five years. But um, as time goes on, I had a family there when I left the West Indies. And after I came, I took the children up, so I know I couldn't go back straight away. But um, after the children grew up, but I just feel like staying on. When I started, I started on it. Nine pounds, 13 and 11 or something like that per week. That's training as a conductor. And after you passed out, I got 11 pounds something a week. I came to friends and really I can't remember how much I had to give, but I know I did contribute. But then, in those days, a pound meant a lot. Even, to, even half a crown meant a lot, two and six pence. I can't remember, like, beer. You could have bought a pint of beer for eight pence, maybe less. One of the main things in mind it was to get my family together. So I started working and trying to save to get my own property. I brought up my children, send them to school, look after them till they become of age to take care of themselves. I knew that I had a hard time bringing up my family. There were a lot of tragedies. I lost my wife. Then I had a daughter, got killed. And those sort of things really stress you out. But still there were good things. So to survive you have to mix the good with the bad. And it needs a lot of patience, a lot of perseverance and provided you give it a good crack of the whip. Well, in my circumstances, I have no regrets. I originally come from British Guyana, Georgetown. I was born 15th of January or was it the 14th of January, 1922? I love women, and I love fighting, and I love gambling, don't forget that. I love gambling too. Back home, I never allowed anyone to try to abuse me or talk to me funny. I punch them. My father at a bakery, and they will go there and tell my father, um, Peter O's son, beat up my son, came home all in blood. Well, that's what used to happen. 
And my father used to say, you, 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 you disgrace me. You disgrace the family. I love it. I love fighting, even street fighting. I was very artful in boxing. Very, very artful. So I, I, I could have defended myself then. And a very good right hand and a left hook. Sometimes I think and consider what I used to do. What is my nature? I couldn't help it. I didn't need to come to England because my father was very, very wealthy. Very wealthy. When I left school, I used to do the bookkeeping for him. Then I got the job. I asked his permission if I can get to accept a ship job or look for a ship job, he gave me his permission. So I went and worked on the four ship by the SS named SS Gamma. And eventually it caught a fire off Trinidad. And we lost I lost everything. We were compensated. Then I get a job on the SS Blackbeard. We used to do regular trips to Jamaica. After the war started, Winston Churchill wanted um, for us to come in Iraq for the army. So I volunteered, myself and others. Eventually, I missed the ship coming to England in the Iraq. I done my service at home. After the war, they wanted us to return to England, which was known as our mother country. It was the Empire Windrush. Oh, it was huge. It was huge, massive ship. Very, very entertaining because they had dancing, they had, a, what do you call it, floor shows. And it's a fantastic scenery. Fantastic. I was thrilled when we docked, there was cameramen and I was just coming out the galley at the time for breakfast and I was waving a cup so as to be noticed. Well, when we arrived it was mild. What's going on? This house on fire, smoke coming out the chimney, not knowing that there was coal fire in those days. So when I came to Telford, I've never seen houses like that in the West Indies, different altogether. And they took us and showed us the foundry where we were supposed to be start work. Then they took us from the foundry to a place where they called Apple Castle Hostel and we registered. We started to work the following week at the foundry and a few weeks, a couple of weeks after, the lad said, oh, there's a boxing at fair in Oaking Gates, and there's a boxing booth there. So I said, yes. So the Friday I got my gears and I went with the intention to fight. So on the stage they had few boxers, and they said, who would like to challenge one of these boxers? So of course I put my hand up. I said, well, who would you like to fight? I said, that one there is my size. So when I got into the ring, I saw this lad in the ring and I said, well, excuse me, who, this is not the lad that I challenge. He says, oh, the lad that do challenge is not well, so we replace a substitute. So uh, of course he was bigger than me. I wasn't afraid. And I knocked him out in the second round. Some of the lads wouldn't go out from the hostel. They're afraid to get out. The white lads used to abuse us. Why don't you all moonshine blacky go back to your country? Well, of course, I wouldn't stand for that. Some of the colored lads which couldn't, who couldn't fight, defend themselves, they used to run. So I used to stop and defend them as much as possible. I never ever been on the losing side. I guess it's my nature. I usually go to the bookie. I win two, three, four, five thousand pounds and spend it in the home 
with paying off higher porches, paying bills. My wife used to put the rent money in a, in a tin. Sometimes when I lose on the dogs, I say, well, the only way I can get this money is to take the rent money. And I used to go and lose it. On Monday when the rent man called, my wife goes in the tin and there's no rent money. So when I come home on the Monday night, it's problems, quarrel. Well, of course I'm divorced. I live in my own life, my wife is living her own life now, but we do get in touch with each other. She's at present living in Canada. Whenever I go to Canada, we see each other. I have no regrets. It's my mother country. The abusers in the street, why don't you go back to your country, Blackie, Darkie, Moonshine, whatever name they feel to call us. I said, well, this is my country, and I saw my country, and I'm entitled to hear I born under the British flag, the red, white, and blue. I'm English, true born under the British flag. So I'm entitled, so don't you shut up. Don't worry, tell me, go back to my country, or else you'll be having one. Yes, you'll be having one. That's right, and such like, but I met my wife, I have a beautiful family. I worked all through my life from the day I arrived. Well, today, with our help, coming to England, we rebuild England. And I am proud. And the generation of today should be proud and happy of us who came in the nineteen in the nineteen forties.